Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Today, we're joined by Dr. Aaron Tomiyama, and we are going to be speaking about our toric orthokeratology lenses, the best treatment for axial elongation. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you again for joining us for the Myopia Podcast. I'm here with Dr. Erin Tomiyama, and I am super, super excited. I have heard her lecture. I have looked admirably upon her work and uh, finally have tracked her down and convinced her to hang out with me on the podcast. It is a pleasure to have you. How are you doing today, Erin? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to sit down and chat. Yeah, absolutely. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, schooling and PhD work and uh, what you're doing now at SCCO? Yeah, so I'm a Southern California native. I went to UCLA for undergrad and then uh, SCCO, Southern California College of Optometry at Marshall B. Ketchum, very long name, um, for optometry school. Um, knew pretty early on that I wanted to do a contact lens residency. So Um, decided to apply to the University of Houston, did a cornea and contact lens residency, and partway through residency, really had the opportunity to um, work with Catherine Richdale, um, who does amazing work in myopia. And so she really convinced me, um, you know, to further further my education. So I decided to first only committed to a master's, then got roped into a PhD. (laughs) So um, spent several years in Houston doing a PhD on myopia. So I'm really excited to be here to talk to you today. Yeah. Um, and then most recently, uh, finished the PhD and accepted a faculty position back at SECO. So, you know, you can take the Southern California away from me, but I'll always come back to it. That's right. And uh, in SCCO, Southern, Cal- Southern California College of Optometry at Marshall Ketchum, University is very honored to get to have you back. I'm sure it's awesome. Uh, such a great program. And uh, you're kind of starting myopia clinic, right? You're kind of getting it up and going and uh, all the fun stuff that goes along with that. Yeah, yeah. So there's, uh, you know, we've been doing myopia control just in different fashions sure. and and at an at a academic institution, it's very different than private practice, right? Where there's, you know, a pediatrics department and a contact lens yeah. department. And it's not just you get whatever you get, you kind of get yeah. funneled into these specialty departments. And so we've been doing it, but kind of an, a mix in different departments. And so um, my big undertaking now is kind of getting us all together and building one cohesive, um, you know, myopia control clinic. Yeah. And uh, great and exciting things to come out of it, I am sure. So let's get into uh, a topic I'm dying to know a little bit more about. You know, um, a couple of years ago, I started switching and uh, and started to do uh, astigmatism correcting lenses for um, for for my patients with orthokeratology, especially in the arena of myopia management and um, was a little surprised to see how that has grown and risen in popularity with me and my patients of how many more patients I'm doing astigmatism correction on. And uh, I think there's a general trend in the eye care space for orthokeratology to be doing astigmatism correction. But in general, the arena of myopia management seems to kind of turn a little bit of a blind eye to a lot of these kids who have astigmatism because we've got soft multifocals in the arena of myopia management, but we don't have anything approved for astigmats. And they account for nearly, uh, you know, the number better than I, but nearly 20% of the, the population. Maybe it's a little bit higher than that if you think of kids who need myopia management. So kind of speak to us a little bit about this astigmatism topic, because you did your PhD in this arena. How did this kind of come into play for you and get you thinking that this was a topic worth diving into? Yeah, so it really all started when I had a, a patient who was, you know, a myopic astigmat and and I wanted to do ortho K. He wanted to try it. It was it was an 
optometry student. So it wasn't, you know, the -hmm. pressure wasn't on. And so I was able to kind of tinker around and order different lenses and whatnot. And this was around the time these torque periphery ortho K lenses really started to become more mainstream. Um, And so yeah, that's how that's kind of how this all started. We we went down the route of trying to implement this these torque ortho K lenses to correct his vision, um, and realized that there wasn't a whole lot of information in this area, and so that kind of got the wheels turning. And I myself am a myopic astigmat, so of course there's you know some ownership there as well. And so yeah, that that's kind of how how I started. Um, Really, the the percentage the percentage that you're looking for is 28.4 percent in one study <laughs> of uh, 2,500 American children that shows the prevalence of astigmatism. And yeah, it's really wow. you know they're they're out there. They they exist, um, and they are coming to your office for myopia management. Yeah, um, so nearly a third of all yeah. uh, of all kids that are and so. Without great solutions to this, it drives us in the direction of, and we, we, we can talk, talk, talk products here. We're talking about, um, you know, the uh, Cooper Vision, multifocal toric, distance center design. Those are options. Okay. We could do mm-hmm. custom lenses that are soft multifocals with toric designs with distance center. Um, and then obviously in the ortho K arena, um, and, and that's kind of what we have, although there are options, there's not a lot of options, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so I think that's why people kind of shy away from, from using any of these modalities because the options that we have, they're few and far between. And up until recently, right, the, the soft lens market was really pro clear torque multifocal, which is not not everyone's favorite lens, but, you know, mm-hmm. being a hydrogel and all. Um, but now with biofinity towards multifocal, that's uh, definitely more of an option, a readily yeah, available and, option. And certainly a good option, right? So from a spherical component, a lot of Jeff Welling's work was done in the ProClear yeah. biofinity multifocal design and, mm-hmm. and showed certainly showed some effectiveness in the myopia management. But one of the questions is, is the effectiveness the same for toric as it is for sphere, and you looked a little bit in that. So tell us a little bit about um, about why that question kind of comes up. Is like, should we just assume that it's the same? Right. Yeah. There's really no literature out there that tells us about the efficacy of these lenses. Right. We already know that we're prescribing them off label, um, but there's no nobody is looking at the efficacy. And in our study, we didn't technically didn't look at that either. Right. We we did um, a crossover mm-hmm. study in non presbyopic adults, so it wasn't in kids. It wasn't longitudinal. We were really trying to just compare um, soft torque multifocals with torque ortho K. We looked at peripheral refraction, higher order aberrations, and just overall acceptance. Um, But we still don't have the information, and that's still an area that we need to explore as a community of researchers looking at myopia and and astigmatism and you know what the what the long-term efficacy is. We 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 still don't know the answer. Yeah. Well, so as a clinician um, who that's my primary hat. You know, I'm looking at the literature and, you know, I try to connect dots, right? I mean, that's kind of what clinicians do and researchers, they just connect dots with research and, mm-hmm. and they build out and I'm wanting to know an answer. And so I just summarize something myself to try to figure something out. And that's probably good, but probably also bad. But one of the things that you looked into uh, that really caught my eye is is I've been really excited to, to have read some studies that talk about higher amounts of spherical aberration and coma may be better for our myopic patients to help slow down the prescriptions that they have. And that's something you looked into a little bit. Can you share with us the differences between spherical and toric, um, you know, some of the results that, from some of the studies, which 2021 and 22 were really good years for your publications. I looked into it. You published a lot of stuff in those three years, <laughs> right, around this. So talk a little bit about aberrations and what we know about that. 
Yeah. So there have been several studies that have looked at higher order aberrations and specifically honed in on terms such as spherical aberration and coma, which you already mentioned. Um, across the board with our spherical versions of you know, or non toric versions. I hate to say spherical because they're not really spherical, right? They're but not, they're no, multifocal. Right. Mm-hmm. But the non toric versions uh, of ortho K lenses, as well as um, soft multifocal lenses, we see that they're increasing these higher order aberrations. And there's mm-hmm. been studies that have looked at, you know, increase in higher order aberration and specifically maybe spherical aberration being um, related to slowing axial elongation. Now, again, nobody has looked at the long-term data with toric, the right. toric versions, but we know from the spherical versions, at least, that there's potentially a relationship between increasing higher order aberration and slowing axial elongation. Okay, so just as a reacher, you would have to point out that there's no data showing that higher <laughs> amounts of aberration <laughs> or the toric lenses does not mean that with higher aberrations in spherical patients, it means that axial elongation change, right? Of course, you have to point that out. But for me, I'm trying to connect A plus B equals C. So A plus BC equals C as well, right? Right, Um, yeah. So we might be able to say in some arena, of course, the study needs to be done, but if we can induce uh, those aberrations. And we looked at, um, you know, in my work, the the subjects all wore the lenses for at least 10 days and we measured higher order aberrations after 10 days of wear um, and and got pretty similar numbers, although it's variable when you look at the literature because higher order aberrations are dependent on pupil size and what instrument you use. And there's not really, you know, not a whole lot of people have aberrometers. <laughs> you're, you're mostly looking at academic institutions and, and there are different types of aberrometers and not all are commercially available. So there's a lot of variability in the measurements, but overall, generally speaking, I think we're getting about the same amount of higher order aberrations with our non-toric versions and our toric versions of these lenses. Yeah, so you're you're saying that they're about the same. So what about if I fit a kiddo with a... Uh, so I, I, I want to clarify what you said. So if I took a patient with a relatively non-toric cornea and had non amount of cylinder, and I fit them with a, again, spherical ortho K lens or spherical soft multifocal, the amount of induced aberration for that is equivalent to somebody who has astigmatism or a toric cornea and we fit them with these other designs. Is that is that what you're saying that they're about the same? I would say ballpark around the same. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, we're looking at averages from one study compared to averages from another study. Sure. So the precision there uh, on that statement that can't necessarily hold true. But yeah, well, yeah. overall about the same. Um, we also know that you know if we tried to put a spherical lens on a toric eye we're probably going to get lens decentration, which then means we're going to induce some sort of astigmatism, which then could result in these higher order aberrations as well. So Mm -hmm. that's another thing to consider, right? We didn't necessarily look at lens centration um, in our study and what the relationship of, you know, any sort of decentration would be to these higher order aberrations. Yeah. So uh, as a clinician um, who you see patients, Mm-hmm. What do you think the the data has really pointed to for you as as a clinician that's somewhat changed the way that you do things for your patients in in clinic because of all of this astigmatism work that you've done? How how do you think you see patients different knowing what you know now from your work? Yeah, I obviously and not one to shy away now from from these methods that we have. I think initially people are very um, unsure about, you know, fitting toric ortho K or fitting um, soft toric multifocal lenses. So um, one, you know, we should be able to use the, the modalities that we have, but also just looking at 
what we found looking at higher order aberrations, seeing that there are more higher order aberrations induced with torque ortho K compared to soft torque multifocals. And similarly, more peripheral myopic defocus with torque ortho K compared to the soft torque multifocals. Then perhaps, you know, when I have that patient, I'm maybe more inclined to fit them in, in torque ortho K over a soft torque multifocal. Now those are generalized statements, of course, but sure. yeah. I think I'm I'm not one to now shy away from torque ortho K. Okay? And I think that's almost like the most daunting to a clinician is trying yeah. to fit one ortho K, but to a toric, you know, an astigmatic lens. Right. Well, I think that kind of goes down to what is our main objective when we're doing myopia management. And our main objective is to slow eyeball elongation or stretching, as I like to call it, as much as possible. Uh, our, our aim is not to improve vision. Atropine being a prime example, we put people on atropine that doesn't improve vision, but it slows down the progression. And I think what oftentimes has happened is we oftentimes as clinicians are so focused on the visual acuity and the improvement mm -hmm. and the clarity of vision that it takes us away from maybe the maximum myopia management, which when I flipped those as my importance, it totally altered how I fit my patients. And I think to your point is that if, if you're thinking about the complexity of a fit, you may gravitate towards a soft multifocal toric because you're thinking that those toric ortho Ks sound very daunting. And I think having done as many as you've done, you might agree with me that really once I started using toric ortho K or toric peripheral curves, um, it actually made my overall ortho K fitting better and more effective. And I got better centration in more of my patients mm -hmm. and it actually made me a better ortho K fitter because I, I gravitated to those toric lenses more frequently. And what you're telling me is that I may be getting some of the, the, the good side effects that we would see in other studies may slow down axial elongation even more. And that's kind of what I took away from your research is that we really should gravitate towards orthokeratology in those cases um, as opposed to shy away from it, right? Right, yeah. And I think you also bring up a good point of you know, the, the purpose of torque ortho K or adding torque peripheral curves is really to improve the centration of the lens. We know that if we get the lens centered, we're going to get treatment in the right place. We're probably going to get a better outcome overall. Although there's a lot of talk recently about decentered, decentered yes. ortho K lenses. So we'll just ignore that for now. But, yeah. um, you know, and so it's not necessarily to correct the amount of astigmatism. And I think people right. think like, oh, well, you know, if I have a two, diop two diopters of astigmatism, I'm not going to correct all of it. And yeah, you're, you're not, you're not going to correct all of the astigmatism, but are you going to provide, you know, a sufficient amount of peripheral myopic defocus? Are you going to correct the vision enough to where the patient is functional? It's always a balance. Like you're saying, we, we want to prioritize myopia management and what will slow axial elongation, but we also need to at least consider the visual acuity or the visual performance too, right? Because if the visual acuity is so poor, the patient's probably not going to wear the lens. So there's some, some trade-off each way. Absolutely. I think it's great work. I'm glad you spent all the time that you did looking into this and, and <laughs> making you. us better as clinicians. I appreciate your perspective. So thank you for sharing up more about it with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Stay tuned for future episodes where we'll bring in amazing guests like this one. Talk about myopia management on the Myopia Podcast. One, two, three, thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.